this is Victor Torres, author of Perfect Love, Castle of Fear, and we are in chapter 6, the last chapter, and the last section of this, of this book for this reading. This section is called Crush to Powder. Matthew 21, verse 44 declares, And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. I used to think this verse should be translated something like this. You better hurry and decide to throw yourself on Jesus so there will be something remaining of you. If you don't, he'll squish you until there's nothing left. In my ignorant thinking, grinding was a bad thing, the last alternative for the really stubborn lives, or the stubborn ones. God doesn't want to crush us, but crush our pain and the things that cause our pain. He wants to fall on us when we present ourselves in complete surrender to Him so we can feel His love the way we need to be loved. The Lord wants every trace of our fears, unresolved anger, and unhealthy coping behaviors to be crushed into nothingness. Every hint of self-reliance, envy, hatred, and bitterness to be destroyed. Why? If we surrender completely, we'll be freer to experience His no-strings-attached, unconditional love for us and more quickly receive healing and deliverance from the pollutants of this world because we won't have any secret sins that prevent the promises of God from fully manifesting. This reminds me of reading about a skilled potter in Bible times who was an expert at taking cracked and broken pottery that others considered worthless. But to this experienced craftsman, they were valuable. He could take two or three old pots and crushed them to a powder so fine that one was completely indistinguishable from the others. Then the potter would mix the powder with oil and water to make fresh clay with which he could fashion something new and without flaw. Author Brian G. Wood, Ph.D., writes that as the clay yields itself to the potter, so the Christian must submit to the authority of God. When clay is first brought in from the field, it is unusable. It's hard and full of impurities. As the clay must be refined, so too must the Christian be refined before he can be shaped into a useful vessel by the master potter. Impurities have to be removed and tempering agents added. The Christian has to be softened and kneaded. In short, the Lord is the master potter and he shapes a believer according to his will. Since God is full of divine wisdom and knowledge, He knows how to form us in such a way that we'll be the most useful for His service. This is how He wants to shape and perfect His bride. After we have been crushed, in other words, died to our sinful nature, then God can add the living water or anointing oil of the Holy Spirit to form a vessel which will be strong enough to contain His power and glory without being shattered or corrupted. In reality, we have no right to question what the master craftsman is doing in us, because since he formed us with his own hands, he certainly knows what he's doing when he continues to shape us throughout our lives in order that we can function as an effective vessel for his glory. Isaiah 64, 8 reminds us, But now, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are potter, and all we are the work of your hand. Isaiah 57.15 declares, For thus says the High and Lofty One, who inhabits eternity, whose name is Holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with Him who has a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. The word in Hebrew for contrite is daka, and it really means crushed to powder. If you ever wondered how you could dwell in the house of the Lord, this is the way in. You must die to yourself and be crushed to powder. Entering into the promised land. Just as the Lord wanted to take the children of Israel to their promised land, He also wants to lead us out of the dry desert places to which we've been wandering and grown comfortable with and into a place of rest in His courts. He longs to lead us into our promised land of great quantity and rest just as he led Joshua and Caleb to a physical place of abundance for remaining faithful to him. Hebrews 3, 18 and 19, and also chapter 4, verses 1 to 2, begins by telling us how we failed to enter in. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, 
but to those who did not obey. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, or in other words, be concerned, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Because the children of Israel refused to believe God's promise that he would be with them and deliver the nations into their hands, they could not enter their place of rest. Disobedience is the fruit of unbelief, and the Israelites chose foolishly when they failed to trust the Lord for deliverance. This grave sin stems from fear, from the fear that God is unable to effectively control the circumstances or the situation. Yes, the Israelites believed in God, but simply believing is not enough. James 2, 19 and 20 says, You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, foolish man, that faith without works is dead? If our belief is not translated into the action of trusting obedience, then it profits us nothing. God knows the difference between lip service and loving adoration, between pretenders and genuine contenders or servants of the Lord, between the faithless and the faithful. Hebrews 4, verses 9 to 11 declares that there remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Mature believers are filled with God's peace and radiate the joy of the Lord because they know in their hearts that Jesus Christ loves them and they willingly humble themselves before him. This is the key to entering the promised land. We prove to God that we love him by obeying him and living a virtuous life. But what does that mean exactly? It means that they know their Heavenly Father loves them. It means that they dare to lay themselves upon the Lord's altar, bear every dark part of their souls before Him, and trust Him to reveal their sins and heal their deepest hurts. In essence, they allow Him to purify in a short time what they would not be able to do themselves in a lifetime, because only God can forgive sins. Fear not. Listen to the words of encouragement that Moses gave to Joshua before all of Israel about overcoming fear as he stood on the brink of the promised land for the second time in Deuteronomy 31, verses 7 to 8. Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with the people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. Notice that the one bit of advice the Lord gave to his people through Moses was, Do not fear nor be dismayed. When God himself spoke to Joshua after Moses died, in the space of just a few moments, he said three times, Be strong and of good courage. Only be strong and very courageous. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Joshua 1, 6, 7, and 9. I believe he wanted to get his point across. God was saying, pay attention. Why was the Lord so emphatic to Joshua about being courageous? It was the very sins of doubt, unbelief, and fear which had kept the children of Israel from entering the land of Canaan 40 years earlier. And these same sins were what stood between them and their promised rest from endless wandering. The only ones who could prevent them from obtaining the promise yet again were themselves. Remember, God never desired to see them homeless and lost in the desert, and neither does he desire to see us drift aimlessly through life without any hope. The Lord loves us today just as much as he loved that lowly group of doubting, rebellious former slaves. Like them, God loved us when we were unlovely, and he has also promised to go before us as we seek to obtain the same blessing that was promised to them. It's our rightful inheritance as his children. However, we must also keep in mind that the only ones who can keep us from entering therein and growing spiritually are ourselves. Not even Satan has the power to prevent us from drawing closer to Jesus, even though he often tries to intimidate us into thinking that we're at his mercy. We must not forget that he is a master of deception. There is no fear in love, 
The perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. 1 John 4.18 So God's perfect love casts out not some, but all fear, and he who fears has, had, has not yet been perfected. Since we are fearful human beings by nature, we are all a work in progress. As a bride of Christ, have you allowed Jesus, your groom, to drive apprehension out of your life? There is no other way into the promised land of rest in Christ except through complete obedience and yielding control to Him, even when it seems foolish in the physical realm. Through total surrender, we prove our love to God. Does that mean we'll never be afraid? Of course not. The Lord knows we're human. There's a reason why God tells us hundreds of times in the Bible to not be afraid, because He knew we would be afraid. He knows we won't win every battle with our flesh because of our fallen sinful nature. But he expects us to push past that fear as quickly as possible. And the more battles we win against this evil influence, the more courageous and steadfast we become in our trials because of our increased trust in God. It's okay to be afraid, but it's not okay to stay afraid. The Lord understands there will be times when we give in to fear, but we can't stay there. We must slay that Goliath as soon as possible before it destroys us. Each time we enter his throne room through prayer, fear will become less intimidating and Jesus will become more irresistible because his love for us is like an all-consuming fire. This is how we gain strength over our weaknesses. This is how even in our brokenness we can be filled with the joy of being in God's presence and how even in dying to our sinful nature, we can be fully alive in Christ by embracing God's love. Prayer unlocks the key in our heart that allows us to serve and worship the Lord with reckless abandon. Joshua 24:15 declares, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. We have two choices, the God of fear, or in other words, Satan, or the God of love, Jesus. You will either be found defected to the enemy's camp or perfected in Christ when you choose to trust Him with all of your worries, hurts, and dreams. The promised land today can be found in a pure heart, and it awaits you if you choose to die to your fears and dare to love the Lord with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The choice is yours. Will you dwell in the wilderness of fear, or will you dwell in the house of the Lord? Choose the way of love, not fear, because perfect love casts out all fear. And in ending, I'm going to share a poem with you uh, that captures uh, the meaning behind this chapter. This is called Perfect Love Castle of Fear. Take heed, my friends, and listen to the voice of the Lord, for many have been deceived and fallen astray. The message I now give you must not be ignored. His grace will save you if you choose to obey. Have you lived your life according to the world's ways? Have foreign voices caused you to run and hide? Have they blinded you from the truth and caused you to stray? And is your way of survival really the serpent of pride? The fruit of the garden remains appetizing, but the idols you so carefully erected, blaming, minimizing, and rationalizing, will leave you broken, lonely, and painfully infected. Beware of your enemies, doubt, unbelief, and fear, for they will try to enter your heart and destroy you from within. Cling to faith, hope, and love when adversaries appear. And don't be enticed by lies that tempt you to sin. In the same way that Christ showed love and courage when he died, face your hurts head on with the innocence of a child. Fear will flee at once when it sees God's love strings tied to a heart that's loving, kind, and undefiled. Your obedience will part any red sea you must cross. Your faith will grow as you walk forward and believe. God is your mast, so don't worry about suffering loss. Just trust the Holy Spirit and you won't be deceived. David slew a mighty giant as he ran toward the Philistine. Caleb and Joshua guaranteed victory when they were commissioned. As they exercised their faith, God appeared on the scene. They held on to their integrity against great opposition. Conversely, Achan and his wife disobeyed the word of the Lord, thinking they could hide their sins so no one would know. 
But God saw the abominations they tried to hoard, and for their secret sins they died as God's foes. Die to yourself, if heaven is your eternal goal. Let the Lord crush you to powder through the work of his hands. Allow him to break you, give up your stubborn control, and dare to gaze into Jesus' eyes and see the promised land. Hold fast in your commitment, lest you be found defected to the enemy's camp who desires to steal away your soul. Love the Lord with all your heart so you can be perfected and drink of the living water that will make you whole. Listen to the message I bring you from above. When you seek me, you will find me when you draw near. If you love one another, I'll perfect you in my love. And know, my child, that perfect love casts out all fear. Special closing message. In the event that you were able to read all the way through this book, and you still don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would like to invite you to ask Him into your life. As you read this prayer aloud, mean it with all your heart. Heavenly Father, I confess to you that I am a sinner in need of forgiveness for all of my sins. I'm sorry for all the ways that I have disobeyed you. I want to turn from my wicked ways and start a new life with you. I thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross in my place as a penalty for all of my sins. I accept his blood sacrifice as atonement for all the sins of my past, present, and future. I accept as truth what Jesus declared in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Therefore, I will stop striving to get to God my own way. Now I choose to leave my old ways behind, and I choose to walk daily in God's way with the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Congratulations. The Bible says that your name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and that because you have chosen to live for the Lord, you are now promised a place in heaven. Now you must commit yourself to live for the Lord daily with the help of the Holy Spirit. Jesus announced in John 14, 18, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. The Holy Spirit now is in constant communion with your spirit, which is now alive in Christ, to convict you whenever you sin, so you can repent immediately. He is also now always with you to comfort you during difficult times, to heal you of all kinds of pain, to guide you when you are in need of direction, and to teach you how to pray to the Father. Now it's time for you to start growing spiritually. Commit yourself to praying, reading and studying the Bible, and establishing yourself in a sound Christian church where you can learn about water baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, salvation, prophecy, healing, and deliverance. If you are faithful to seek the will of the Lord, then out of your love for Him, the Holy Spirit will help you to live a holy life, and you will experience the spiritual, emotional, physical, and relational healing that you so deeply desire. I pray that God will richly bless you in your new life with Him that has just begun. God bless you, everyone.